actually doing that as we speak going mm -hmm. uh going live so well hello and actually speaking of going <laughs> live we are live um, hello wait, i know why should i be surprised <laughs> That I, that we're, live. What? We're, we're live when, when, <laughs> when did this I happen click the button all right hello 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 and welcome to intercultural spark my name is deanna shas i am your host and this is the show about that spark inside you that drives you to drive uh, to spark change in the world with your businesses and your life projects and so each week we bring on guests who will give a little bit of a secret about how they do it and hopefully that will actually help others uh, want to make change as well. Uh, our guest this week is someone I've known for, I'll just say a couple of years, because otherwise we'd have to both be really old. But my guest is Michael War, who is an award-winning poet. He is, um, he's actually amazing. He's a, he's an award-winning poet. He, uh, oh my gosh. And also just like a, a nonprofit leader. Uh, I was impressed that Gwendolyn Brooks was doing commentary on your poetry because she's amazing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but also, yeah, that's incredible. But also someone you're just igniting change through the written word, which is really powerful and really amazing. So I am going to welcome you to Intercultural. I did it again. I always cut myself off with my video. I get so excited to play it. So that last sentence was, welcome to Intercultural Spark. Woo! <laughs> Good to be here. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you so much for being here at like seven in the morning because you're based in San Francisco. Yeah. I mean, I'm normally up earlier, but um, not normally doing interviews at this time of the morning, but I'm glad we're doing this one. <laughs> me too. Me too. Because there's lots to talk about. And, you know, I wanted to really actually dive in with a project. So again, we've known each other from your work when you were at the Guild Complex in Chicago. But one mm -hmm. of the things that I always loved was how cross cultural and cross discipline. Mm -hmm. And that's always been something that seems to be very dear to you. And mm -hmm. I saw the project, which is the, um, the two languages, one community. So That's right. yeah, can you tell us about that? It's go ahead and tell us. I can set it up, but you mm -hmm. know it so well. So tell us about that project and then how it does cross all those mm -hmm. lines. Well, one thing I can say is that the way that project started, first of all, I always wanted my poetry translated into Chinese. Don't ask me why. Okay, no reason, um, there's just a, the thing. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of Chinese readers, right? And mm -hmm. So I always wanted my po po poetry published in Chinese, and I did all my Michael War things, you know. I reached out to my network. I put it out there in the world. This normally works for me. I even reached out to a friend in China, um, but it wasn't working. And so I just decided to put it on the back burner. When the opportunity comes up, I'll go for it. Mm -hmm. And then I was doing this reading in San Francisco, a poetry reading at Fort Mason here. And um, someone in the audience who was at the reading that night came up to me afterwards. And not only was she Chinese, but she was a Chinese translator. And we wow. met the very next morning. Her name is Chung Yu. She's a great poet herself, also a translator. I told her about my dream. And within, you know, 24 hours, we were starting to collaborate. And eventually what happened is she started translating my poems. I started editing her poems because she also works in English. And that was the beginning of um, me to, you know, suggesting that, yeah, we could, we could bring this to communities because I've been translated in other languages. And I always realized that when you are being translated, that you both have to really get into each other's culture to get at a true translation. And that was the beginning of mm -hmm. two languages, one, one, one community. Mm -hmm. And it's really taken off. Mm -hmm. That started in 2014. Mm -hmm. You know, just one comment on that. My undergraduate degree was in comparative literature. And there was a whole mm. study of, of translation and the art of translation and the whole idea of, well, who's the artist if you're reading a yeah. translated work? Like that is mm -hmm. fascinating with alliteration that's, and sound. Yeah. And, mm. That is that's such a key, key point because I think that because Chun Yu is a poet, 
you know, and she's a wonderful poet herself. Mm-hmm. That that finds its way into the translation of my poem. Mm-hmm. And so it is two artists working to, to, to together very, very closely. Mm -hmm. You know, one other thing that I just have to point out for people who are listening, and also thank you for people who are joining us live. You can always ask questions or say hello. We don't know if you're here unless you say hello. So say hello in the comments. But there's something you said that I'm a firm believer in as well, is that you manifest it. You manifested it to be real, put it into the universe. And you're like, oh, and like always happens with me, the universe came back and it worked out. That is, that's cool. That's powerful. Yeah, it happened. It happened a little <laughs> differently that time. But I have to say that I think, I think of poetry as a spark. And mm-hmm. the thing is, is sure. that the, um, I really do. When people ask me, how do I write a poem? Why do I write a poem? I always say, with me, it comes with a spark. And, and, and it's because I can write about anything. Um, mm-hmm. I pride myself on that, but I tend not to. I, I develop something into a poem and there's a spark that pretty much tells mm-hmm. me this has to be done and you have to be the one to do it. Wow. And I felt that way about this project, but I have to find a meandering way to get to it and to make it real in the, in, 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 in the world. But it all started with, a, with, with mm-hmm. that spark. And then the, the, the meeting of people in public, that's another kind of key mm-hmm. thing, being out there in the world. So I met Chun Yu at a literary event that was mm-hmm. organized by an old poetic mentor of mine, Jack Hirschman here in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Chloe, thank you, Chloe, for being here. Chloe said she's so here for the poetry, which <laughs> thank you, is a really good setup because so so what you just said is you look at people you've known across your life, like they're they're now part of your 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 universe or your being, so connecting in the past. But with this project, I know there was a big event in San Francisco where you did mm-hmm. five readings on the 30th. Um, mm-hmm. So there's been, and I saw that you did a program on because of the an, the rise in anti-Asian mm-hmm. hate that's been mm-hmm. happening. And so yeah. you've connected this project to that. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us about the social side of it? And then I can't wait to hear, you said you've selected a poem to read to us today about that. Sure. Right. Yeah, I've always been a very much an activist and uh, mm-hmm. my poetry has always been driven since I was a kid by social change. I see poetry as a means of social change. And so with this project, um, Chun Yu and I decided that we needed to do these solidarity of, events that were against this violence and hate. And the first one we did was in April with the Chinese Cultural Center in San Francisco, where we brought in other poets that we're translating into an anthology, by the way. And, um, mm. and we did a bilingual reading and we had music from a wonderful African-American pianist called um, um, Tammy Hall. And so this, is, uh, this was reflected also a few, um, this Sunday in the adventure referred to, which took place in Chinatown at Portsmouth Square. And um, it was part of the um, Asian Heritage Fe- Festival. And so if you want me to, I'll read this poem, this um, poem, was a response, as many of my poems are, is was a response, um, in this case, to the hatred and the violence against Asians. Um, just when the COVID, uh, the pandemic mm-hmm. protocols were starting to take place. And this was happening around the world as well as in San Francisco. It's called mm-hmm. To Your Assailant Who Attacks Us All. Mm-hmm. Do you call yourself God-fearing, devoted to do on to others? Does your God condone your violence? your ignorance, your corruption? Does your God hate your neighbor like you do? Does your God share your love for profits bearing false witness, fueling your grievance fever? Do you swallow the lies they regurgitate? Do you really need a reason? Are you truly a true believer of both God and golden calf? Does the all knowing know you? Do they love you as you are? Does it matter that they are watching your naked depravity? Do you pray before you pray on innocence in this guilty world? Do you have your God's blessing or as you or are you as godless as you seem? Did your father teach you to beat the mean and main? Is he proud of your cowardice? Does your mother say, well done, son? Did they train you in backwardness to feel bigger in your smallness? content with acts of uselessness? Is your inner bully seething still beneath your concealed surface? 
Are you comforted in your criminality, stupefied by superiority, simply insane or lost? Who are you? So I write um, poetry in many different forms, and that was, <sighs> that poem was very, wow. very uniquely um, formed to the situation that I was uh, describing. One thing about the pandemic is that um, I have been commissioned to write so many poems um, um, during this pandemic. And that's one of the poems that grew out of a request made by the Chinese Cultural Center um, to, re to respond to what was going on as an artist in the, in, in the pandemic. Mm. You know, talk about that. I, I just almost had to give a moment of silence around the poem because it's so it's it's so powerful. And that's what's incredible about poetry that in in these few really succinct directed words that you can get so much power. Um, you said something though that I'm also curious about, and this is a 90 degree jump that you've been commissioned to write poems. I'm sure there's a lot of people which you're like, this has been my whole life, but I'm going to say it anyway, in case some of our readers are curious. The business of poetry, how mm -hmm. you actually build a living and a life with poetry. Can you just give us like a little insight to that in terms of how that works to get commissioned to write poems? And by the way, I know you were like the poet laureate for the San Francisco libraries. So mm -hmm. yeah, how you've, and you've won, oh my gosh, dozens of awards. Can you just talk a little bit about the business of poetry? Yeah, I have to say that in my early career, I mean, I've been writing poetry since the ninth grade. <laughs> been a long time. And then, of course, I ran the Guild Complex, um, which I founded in San Francisco. And my attention was always on the poets that I was mobilizing. You know, I, I kind of mm -hmm. saw myself almost as like a union organizer. Um, but I was really operating in the interest of poets. And I was able, fortunately, to pay attention to my own poetry because it was just so embedded in my natural life, so, so, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, I was fortunate, you know, I think just working hard at it, really kind of being out there in the, in, in, in the world. When I first won a National Endowment for the Arts Poetry Award, I know that part of the reason I won that was not just because of the poetry. And you have like a 10 page manuscript. And I think the grant was for like, you, you the award was $20,000. Mm -hmm. It was the first time I had applied. I have amazing, poet friends who'd been applying to that for 15 years, mentors of mine who mm -hmm. had not gotten it. So it's very, very difficult. But I knew how to write a grant. Mm -hmm. so. Which is so funny. So that's an overlap <laughs> with your 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 personal, your My, professional yeah. life as well. One thing, just because you had mentioned you're talking about mentors or things like that. So Stephanie is also a longtime Chicagoan. And I'm assuming mm -hmm. That because in Chicago, Gwendolyn Brooks was our, I think she was the state poet laureate. But Stephanie yes. asked, Did you ever meet meet oh Gwendolyn my God. Brooks? Yeah, that's what she said, asking as Listen, a proud Chicagoan. Yeah, tell us about I that. Used, she's amazing. I used to tease Gwendolyn because I told her I was a poet because of her, and it was her fault. When I was a <laughs> kid growing up in high school in San Francisco, I stole a book, and that book was called 3,000 Years of. Um, Black poetry. And in that book, there it started with anonymous. I mean, literally, it started with anonymous. And then the in the um latter part of the book was this chapter on current African American poets. And that's where I met Gwendolyn Brooks mm. in the pages of that book that I stole. And when I moved to San Francisco, I became really close friends with her. My first so poetry cool. award was from Gwendolyn Brooks. The mm. Gwendolyn Brooks Significant Illinois Poets Award. I was even asked to, um, you know, I, I was even asked at a kind of high level um, lunch in the state capitol when Gwendolyn had passed. I was pretty much told um, by one of the people at that um, lunch, I know who should be the <laughs> next poet laureate of, of um, Illinois, Michael War. And I told him, I said, listen, there are other poets who deserve that who've been around a lot longer than me. I don't know if I would do that today, but that, but that actually <laughs> happened to, to, wow. to, to me. Um, but yeah, she had a profound influence on me. She is my first poetic mentor. And um, I had a really close relationship with her That's incredible. Uh, that I just loved being around her. And she was basically 
you know, she championed the organization that I um, founded, the Guild Complex. Oh, that's what I'm saying. You see, Stephanie says, creative geniuses, both of you can see the connection. And, you know, my <laughs> recollection of Gwendolyn Brooks was when she recited poetry at the South Shore Cultural Center yeah. uh, mm -hmm. years ago. And she just, such a presence, which is the same thing you yeah. have. What What is it that almost, it's like you become another persona. And I noticed that when you oh. recited your poem, you just fill mm -hmm. the space what is there a name for that? Do poets call that something? Because she got on stage and like, mm. I mean, just her alone in a chair on the stage. And you would have thought like, you know, that the the sky had opened and there was just a spotlight <laughs> and it was just her in the world. How do you do that? Or how do you access that? Well, you know, I, obviously it's different from for everyone. There are these things called persona poems, uh, mm -hmm. but I think that's different from what you're talking about. You're talking about the person them, themselves rather than take it. Well, there. I know that in my case, that I consider poetry an alter, you know, it's another um, personality for me, so to speak. It's, it's, a, it's a person, it's a part of myself that I bring into the world that I only do through poetry. Um, it, 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 it's, all, it's almost a dual nature of my character. But I feel compelled to bring that out. And I, I, I see the, the language of poetry as beyond the pedestrian. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I just mean that we need pedestrian language. Otherwise, we couldn't function. I mean, you have to mm. tell me how to get on this site. You know, you have to give me basic instructions <laughs> about what we're going to do today. We need that everyday language. But poetry is an art form that takes it beyond you know, um, the everyday language. When you use everyday language as a poet, it's because you've made that conscious choice, you know, in the way you're going to artfully um, use the form of poetry in that particular um, instance. So yes, um, for me, it is another part of my character that isn't generally there. It's there when I'm being a poet. <laughs> it's not even there when I'm writing poetry. It's there when I'm sharing the poetry. You know, that's kind so of like fun. that's a kind of a ending of the journey, not a, the ending, but bringing the journey to another stage. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny that answers the question, because I noticed in some cases you've got your poetry bio and your poetry persona online. And then whenever mm -hmm. it talks about professional experiences, it says, well, just visit my LinkedIn page. And I have to admit <laughs> that when I work with clients who have mm -hmm. multiple things, I always say, you know, the more that you can align them, it makes sense. But you purposely sure. kept them separate. But now I'm realizing it's because they're they're apparently two separate personalities. Well, sometimes I, <laughs> sometimes I do bring those things together. And for mm -hmm. me, that is something I really do strive to do. It's not always easy. Mm -hmm. um, but for instance, I did an event with the uh, um, Ole Miss, the University of Mississippi, mm -hmm. where I was invited both to um, be a poet and mm -hmm. to share my poetry with the students at a public event and in a classroom. But also I was there consulting with the leadership of the university in diversity development. Mm -hmm. And as, as often as I can, I do try to integrate these things, but that doesn't, that, when I'm meeting with the, the um, chancellor at the university and I'm in the room with, with him and these other leaders of the university, I'm not talking like, a, I'm not acting as if I'm, I'm not acting, the mm -hmm. poet of part of me is somewhat subdued. You know, the business part of me is more there, is more present, but I try to incorporate poetry in everything I, I, I do. I think it's important to know what the distinctions are though, when you're operating in these um, different mm -hmm. worlds. And I have to say that it's rare that I find those opportunities to combine them because mm -hmm. people don't see them as interrelated, but I try to combine them as much as I, as I mm -hmm. can. Mm -hmm. And just for, Clarification for viewers, like you were the deputy director of the the what is it the Museum the, of the, the African Museum. Diaspora. Like mm -hmm. you've you've founded, you've been executive director for not for profits. So when we talk about mm -hmm. your management, this is at an extremely high level. And I just wanted to share. Mm -hmm. Chloe says she loves how you explained it uh, as a dual nature. I write poems to express a part of me I can't mm -hmm. so easily communicate yeah. with the world. Exactly. You know? Yeah, that is so. I think that's the case for so many artists. You know, it's like there's this thing that has to come out that I want to share that I want to say. What means do I have to do that? And what's the best way I could do that? And so for me, I think that's poetry. Mm -hmm. 
Wonderful. Well, we are going to, we are at that time of the show. I warned you this would happen. We are at the time of the show for our flash exercise. <laughs> oh, okay. So, I have so, my wig. so if I had dual personality, my dual personality would be sort of a marketer, interculturalist, and a fitness professional. Mm -hmm. So I do <laughs> combine them. I do combine them with what I call interpretive aerobics, where our fitness exercise relates to the theme of our show. So mm. <laughs> it's a little known genre. <laughs> so if people are able to do this. You can do this seated or standing up. I am going to do this standing. So the exercise that I've chosen today, it's an exercise for your shoulders. I'm going to mm -hmm. show you the exercise and then we'll see how it relates. So if you have weights or I'll just grab here, I'll grab two books off my back shelf here. If you've got um, books or weights, so here's our exercise. If you can do it with me, hands in front of your thighs, you just lift them up to shoulder height. And back down. I, oh, look at you. You've got your weights. Perfect. Do I again. literally have weights. I love it. Shoulder height and down. And then we're going to follow that with the triple pulse right here. Three, two, one, down. So we'll do it again. And then we'll see if you can guess. And then I'll tell you why. So it goes up, down, up, down, lift, two, three, and lower. So that's for your anterior deltoids, front of your arm as you lift, and then just your deltoids overall as you pulse. Can you guess why that made me think of poetry? Um, no. <laughs> okay, I will tell you. <laughs> because it reminded me of reciting poetry. You know, mm. you've got and then boom, 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 you drop that zinger. Do you know what I mean? So I thought it was like, doesn't it feel like the poetry, like kind of the two, three, yes. and down. The, I'll say it's I'll say that it's uplifting. <laughs> there you go. So it's uplifting <laughs> and you get the rhythm of poetry. So <laughs> <laughs> All right. I just wait. Wait, I do birthday parties too. We can spell happy birthday, like whatever you need. <laughs> um that's so funny. Uh, that's so funny. I'm glad that that was my goal. Last year's goal was to try to make people besides me laugh at my jokes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Good you're work. smiling. That counts. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we've got a couple of things. Well, I'm going to ask you one question before you've sent thank you some pictures in advance to get a little mm -hmm. bit more about your depth. But I do want to talk about your books, like you've written or been in mm -hmm. anthologies, like at least a dozen. But we the, the title of the show today was about the power of poetry for social change. So I'm thinking of the book you were editor of, of Poetry mm -hmm. and Protest from Emmett Till to Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that and how. what are some of the subjects and how does poetry drive change. Yeah, uh, that book, that anthology really was in response to police killings. And um, at the time, the reason the book is called A Poetry and Protest from Tim uh, Emmett Till to Trayvon Martin is because it kind of covers this expanse of how long this has been going on. And personally, um, part of my evolution as a poet and commitment to this issue was when I was a kid growing up in San Francisco and I came to a bus stop on my way to my first job and I saw a policeman with a, a magnum in his hand in the face of this kid who was just a few years younger than me. And his hand was literally shaking, shaking. Mm -hmm. And I have really ever since then been on top of this issue and been you know, writing about it and trying to contribute to some change. So A Poetry and Protest is a collection of 40 different poets on this theme, you know, Pulitzer Prize mm -hmm. winners, um, you know, many just poets from all different walks of, of life in it. The book combines in their portrait, images taken by Victoria Smith of each poet. It combines, um, it has an, our archival materials, and it also has a um, essay from each poet. And um, it's done very, very well. It's been reprinted, and you can get it anywhere. Um, I encourage people to get it from the Museum of the African Diaspora. They sell the okay. book. You can also get it directly from the publisher from um, from from Norton. Um, but look it up online; it's available. If you go to my site, you can also get a link to it there. But this is a critical issue, and it's something that unfortunately is not going away. And I see this book as a tool, actually, 
um, to get at this issue and to make people aware of it and not lose the um, knowledge of the fact that this continues to happen. Mm -hmm. And I'll make sure that we put a link in the, in the blog post after the event so that people can find, can find that book. How do you feel it, it strikes me. And this goes back to what I love about you, Michael, as well, mm -hmm. is that it's always, it's not always just the end result, but it's the process. Actually, mm -hmm. I do. I realize that I love that about you, the process of those partnerships and creations, mm -hmm. things that you create. How was the process of bringing these different poets together? Did, were there sparks <laughs> that flew from there? Yeah, I mean, I could talk for hours about this, but when I was, I referred to <laughs> earlier as being at the University of, of Mississippi, when I was there, I got a call from this guy, Phil uh, Cushway, who I wrote the, the book, who, I, who basically underwrote the book, and he had this idea, and he brought me in because another poet had told him he needed to talk to me, and mm -hmm. um, I... I was the perfect person for him to be speaking to because the people who are in this book writing about these issues are basically my tribe because I've been writing about this mm -hmm. issue since I was a kid. But I thought that how can we get all these people together, get their images and their poetry and do it in a way that's feasible and cost effective, basically. And my first thought, well, well, there's the um, annual Associated Writers um, Program conference coming up. And a lot of these writers will be there. There's 10,000 writers mm. there. You can, so few of them are black that you can see, you can find them very easily. Find them. Um, and this was a book <laughs> of all black poets. Mm -hmm. And I, I organized that. I got there the day the conference was opening. I met the person who was running the conference. They happened to know Reginald Gibbons, who I, who was a mentor of mine. Oh, I, I know Reggie. Reginald is just an amazing poet. I mentioned mm -hmm. his name. I mentioned a few other names. They opened the entire conference and staff <laughs> to me. It's incredible. The, 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 the uh, video crew, the photographer flew in that night. And within three days, really two and a half days, um, we had like 40 to 50 poets that we had. That's amazing. Got. We had shot their photographs because you have to have a photograph to be in the book. So that's mm -hmm. just kind of one example of just mobilizing resources, organizing, having a vision, and implementing mm -hmm. implementing it and responding to problems on the spot. Uh, it was a very, very complicated thing to do, and it had all kinds of levels of organizing that you would never imagine, and you will never know from just reading the book the book but yeah it was in many it was kind of like organizing a war wow <laughs> you know i love mobilizing it. so fun well mobilizing poets i think that sounds almost like an ox like an ox not mobilizing poets but just the idea you think of the creative spirit and to do something that needs to be so focused by the way i just want to share yeah. wendy's comment thank you michael mm -hmm. the power of words to educate ourselves leverage our voices building community to write ourselves free wendy herself is hi wendy um wendy herself is actually a really good a really good writer like just a really oh. creative writer so Great. I, we are going to, we could actually talk for hours and hours and hours, <laughs> and I would love to, but that's why I do this segment that is called Flash Photo Stories. <laughs> Wait, what's so funny? That was not me saying that behind the I love um, that. image. <laughs> I'm still waiting. One day someone's going to be like, Deanna, I can get you like a, an actual professional thing, but I do have fun doing it. What's weird is I actually do a dance with it too. I'm like going flash photo stories. <laughs> um, but, um, hey, we create, we create the world we want to see, right? Um, you know, you manifest it and it happens. All right. So this is a way because you are so uh, multifaceted and have so much depth and what we wanted to do here, the flash photo stories, is you've sent us uh, five, uh, about six photos ahead of time. You're going to give mm -hmm. us a two to three sentence story about each. So uh, mm -hmm. what is this? Is that the one with me? Are you referring to the one with me standing in front of the window? Did I end up with two photos? You know what I did? I, is think, you, I think you integrated Oh, my one gosh. The, I did. But I can, talk of, I can talk about both of them. Okay. Yes, so, do. So, so the, uh, the surrounding <laughs> part of it that's in yellow you mm -hmm. see a picture of Chung Yu, and Chung Yu and I organized the first of the Artists Against Anti-Asian Violence Solidarity events. And 
Um, we combined poetry in Chinese and English and, and had music at that event. And we invited the Chinese Cultural Center of San Francisco as our co-sponsor. So the part that you see in yellow, that's what that's about the um, against Asian violence. The one that you see in the middle is a, actually a separate photograph. And that's me standing in front of a um, pandemic poem that I wrote called The City mm. Speaks of This Moment, which is also, I was also commissioned to write that poem Fantastic. by the San Francisco Urban Film Festival uh, this year. That is located in the beautiful Yerba Buena Gardens in the Archer District of San Francisco. And I love poetry being in public spaces. And mm. that is a poetry installation of my poem. Oh, fantastic. So it's right on the front doors of the of the space. You know, that's a wonderful way just for people who are arts administrators or others who might see the show. I've seen poetry on on steps, like walking up steps. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to, I'll share this idea in case anyone can make it happen. I used to do the exhibits and events for O'Hare and Midway. And I always wanted to get a hologram of someone reciting poetry and the name of the installation would be Now Barding. Mm, I love that. Uh, yeah, get, make that make that happen. So, you know, at the time, I mean, that idea was from like the early 2000s when holograms weren't that that sophisticated. Yeah. You could totally, by the way, um, Michael's going to be asking for a commission for this because you're really good at getting at getting grants. We could now with technology, we could actually like beam in poets as holograms to recite poetry to passengers. All right. Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll beam in. I want to beam in. Oh my God. All right. So for any, Wendy, are you still here? Wendy is really good. She's like an art. Wendy, this is like a big arts and business idea that we could make happen. Wouldn't that be cool? You're like riding the conveyor belt and then Michael War comes behind you and excuse me, and then recites a poem. Um, or you're sitting on the train and all of a sudden some, a poet city beside you. <gasps> sits right poem. next to you. A hologram of a poet. Oh one, my of my one of my installations oh. right now is not hol a hologram, but in Golden Gate Park, um, along with other poets, you mm -hmm. can walk through the park and at different locations, you can dial up on your phone a um, reading of, of, of And of hear a poem? A poem? Yeah. Oh my God, that's amazing. With, about trees. Wow, <laughs> so, wow, wow, so wow. Do you want me to talk about this one? Yeah. And actually, let's just really quickly, Wendy, I knew Wendy would know. So poetry on the T, which is the MBTA, the train system in Boston. Mm -hmm. So I guess look at masspoetry.org for that. We'll look at it. Wendy says yes. So she's helped. That means you're helping us, Wendy. Uh, <laughs> so nutty, so wonderful. Um, but yes, tell us about this. So paper. I received a $40,000 grant to create my digital multimedia project called Tracing Poetic Memory in Hunter's Point, in Bayview Hunter's Point, which is where I spent a few years of my childhood in this predominantly black community at the time in San Francisco. I was only seven years old when my family moved out of the neighborhood and I remember very little about it. So I used poetry and digital technology mm. to recover my memory. So this is a combination of me, that's me standing in front of the pyramids in Gaza, uh, excuse me, in, in, in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And um, behind that is this, um, this kind of iconic, um, um, I forget what it's called, oh, it's called a gantry, which they built ships for World War II in this area of the Hunters Point where I spent my childhood. And I combined that to combine two different parts of my life. So that's me standing in Egypt in my early 20s. And behind me is this connection to the Bayview Hunters Point um, community. Anyone who knows about that community will identify with the gantry um, back there in the in, in the background. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of multimedia too, which really allows you to create meaning uh, by by juxtaposing different images or that idea to con to mm -hmm. get the synergies between them. It's really powerful. What's this? So I love getting poetry into different spaces. Like I said, mm -hmm. this is an exhibition based on the book of poetry and protest, which was held at Chicago's. Stony Island Arts Bank, which is a wonderful um, spot. Um, and those images in the background are from the book of poetry and image, poetry mm. and um, protest. And right behind, that artist standing there is Lupe Fiasco, the um, Grammy Award winning American um, mm. um, rapper. And right behind him, that's the image of Amiri Baraka, the great poet, and uh, who's one of the 40 poets in the anthology. And um, that's what that combination of the, you know, a, a gallery, the book, 
as a visit by the by the by Lupe Fiasco. Well, just that idea of the generations. You know, you look at sort of the the elders and young people, and how is how how is everyone creating together and inspiring one another? That just that again, that image, that juxtaposition is so powerful when you yeah. look at all the ideas that are just captured in that that picture. So, I, and that's, a, that's but, again is the, the, the mm -hmm. book. But the story behind this is that I walked into this place in San Francisco called the Market, and when I'm walking through the door, the security guard stopped me and asked me to hold on for a minute. Right, this is an upscale uh, grocery store, and um, he asked me to wait a minute, and that was because a coworker of his had asked him to get my signature for my book the next time that I showed up. And this guy was so inspired that he actually start writing poetry. So I, I like to, I refer to what I call the life of the book. And the book can have this life that's going on on its own away from you. You, you, you know, there, there are stories associated with this life that you don't, may not even necessarily know about. This wow. one I happen to know about. <laughs> <laughs> I am crying. I'm going to go back to the first time. I am crying because we're talking about the spark, like what sparks you to drive change in the world. But the fact that we as individuals each have the power to spark something so meaningful to that person's life just by showing up and being there that you just from that moment sparked someone else to write poetry. Wow. I mean, that's, that's I, phenomenal. And I'm fortunate that a lot of times I get to hear the stories of when that happens, but a lot of times we do those and we never hear about it. Yeah, that that's my, true. That is a picture of my mother. And when I first saw her, her name is um, Gaynell War. Um, mm -hmm. I thought that she looked like a movie star. and But she was teased and insulted for being too black. And so my poem, Black Star, is based on this image. And it's also translated into Chinese by Chung Yu one of the first mm. poems to translate it. And she and I, we often share bilingual poems um, about our mothers and our family. And when we first started, that's what we were, that's what kind of kicked off our collaboration beyond just her translating my poems, is we start looking for commonalities, things that we could write about that were present in each culture. Mm. All right, that's our last photo. We are going to take one last question and then we need to get out of here and let people get on with their day. But Wendy wants to know, and if it's a long answer, we can connect afterwards, but curious if you, Michael, are doing anything around spoken word, social justice with youth. If so, how always looking for ideas? Yeah, I mean, I'm, well, I'm constantly engaged in social justice. That's where my art is rooted. Um, but one thing I'll say off the top of my head, if you go to my Tracing Poetic Memory site, you'll see that I work with um, youth at the um, YMCA um, to kind of mirror a project that I was doing using images to trace my own family's history. And we took digital images that they created and stories that they created. You can find a link to the little digital book we put together for them. But in okay. short, yes. No, go ahead. And actually, she had a follow up and overlay with mental health. I didn't mean to I interrupt did. you, but I just want to make sure this the the Tumblr, the Michael War creative work, yeah. which I'll put in the uh, in the comments afterwards. That's where you can basically. I think you called it your tentacles piece that you can reach yeah. anywhere that Michael goes uh, yeah. from that spot. Thank you. Uh, That's what I was about to say. <laughs> oh. <laughs> There you go. Well, oh my gosh, thank you so much. This was amazing. I don't know how, actually, I do know how we just covered so much time, so which felt like just a minute. Thank you to everyone who watched live. I will make sure that uh, afterwards that every place to find Michael is there because now you've sparked even more change. And that is one final question. What do you think? Is there a single spark or is there something you feel that drives or permeates, underlies all that you do? It's all about transforming society. I mean, that that's what it has been about for me mm -hmm. since I was a child. And I see art as a way to do that. And we need to transform our society. That should be evident to anyone. And we have to find the ways we can make that contribution um, our own way. And art, poetry, is the way that it works for me. And I'm just going to be doing that until the day I die. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love it. It's that upward trajectory. Like why, you know, some people think, oh, I'm getting older. I can retire as life an arc uh, oh. or a trajectory. No, it is a big trajectory for 
ever. Like, like you said, yeah, as long as I'm here, I'm creating. Well, exactly. thank you so much. I hope you'll join us next week. And Chloe, thank you. Chloe said thank you for your honesty. And I'm so glad mm -hmm. you got to see the show as well. Next week, my guests are Juan Rivera and uh, Bobby Madison. Mm -hmm. Juan was actually in prison for 20 years for a crime mm -hmm. he didn't commit. His oh. correction officer, Bobby, they became friends now that Juan is exonerated. Now they've opened a business, a legacy barbershop in Chicago, where they are actually helping other people um, helping other young people and exonerees uh, uh, find find careers. So thank you, Wendy. I'm a new Michael fan. Absolutely. Right to know you is to be a fan. Thank I'm you. with you there. Um, and Stephanie, thank you. Highly valuable and timely interview. Tremendous thanks. So thank you all so much for joining us on Intercultural Spark. And we will see you next week. <laughs>